Hello everybody and welcome to another edition of my top 100 favorite cards of all time. We're getting close ladies and gentlemen, we are in the top 20. It's getting real, cards are getting sweet. Let's get started. Number 20 is Force of Will. Force of Will is clearly a powerhouse card. A card that literally defines formats. If Force of Will were reprinted in standard, whatever the most busted combo is, is where that card would be. Force of Will gives you basically the insurance policies, but the same way it gives you insurance policies to make sure that your cool combos happen is the same way it keeps Legacy in check from going completely off the rails, or Vintage for that matter. The ability to have a free counterspell when it first came out was just not really respected as highly. Now, there used to be a lot of theories about magic. You know, there has there's the philosophy of fire, there's who's the beatdown. Well, that stuff hadn't happened yet. Back in the late 90s, there was this thing called card disadvantage. And if you were spending more cards than your opponent, then you were at disadvantage. You were at a disadvantage, rather. And so clearly... Force of Will is a card disadvantage spell because you're giving up two cards for their one card. And there was a whole cycle of these things. Between Contagion and Force of Will, like plenty of those like pitch a card things saw play. But at the time, it was alliances. Like there was the first few sets of Magic players back in the day. We kind of thought, well, okay, this is like the first of the pitch cards. There's going to be more of these. And there were never any more of these. So that's the thing. Therese Nielsen was supposed to be drawing a red card, which turned into a blue card, which is why Force of Will looks the way it does. Of course, Therese did an amazing job. Absolutely unreal. I'm very glad they got her to uh, illustrate the latest version, which is appreciated and is absolutely gorgeous. Force of Will will just forever live in my mind as one of those cards that absolutely kind of turned the corner because at the time there was a Cadaverous Bloom Prosperity combo that you could use to create a bunch of mana and then draw a bunch of cards, and Force of Will was there to make sure that your combo worked and it really showed what happened if you're in a standard environment with force of will whatever the most busted thing is is what it's going to protect and at the same time able to really keep old formats in check force of will is an unbelievable card totally sweet one of the best magic cards ever made awesome number 19 is Imrakul the Aeon's Torn you know back in my day there was Rise of the Eldrazi, and Rise of the Eldrazi came out, and it was supposed to bring the era of Battle Cruiser Magic. And Battle Cruiser Magic is when you make one thing really ridiculous, and you just herald that thing to victory. That's what you do. Well, Imrakul had to be the biggest, baddest, best creature of all time, and turns out, if you put enough words on these things, they just get so good, you can't turn them down. Now, Imrakul the Promised End is very cool, and is already seeing, like, vintage play, which is ridiculous, but still, Imrakul is meant to be a badass. It's meant to be one of the most awesome things that has ever seen print, and it certainly was. And I live in a world where we got those at the pre-release. They gave everybody Immercool at the pre-release for free. It was nuts. So back when they were giving away a Johnny Vengeance and Immercools and like, here's your sweet mythic rare that you get for free. It was a crazy time, but Imrakul will always just have this incredible power. It clearly drove the story of Shadows over Innistrad. They put her in the moon. It's cool that it's a her, which is kind of neat. It's got little squiggly, you know, appendages, and it's, it's all noodly, and it's super scary, and it has infinite things and words on it, and when you sneak it into play, oh my god. Whether it's from Sneak Attack, or Through the Breach, or anything else, Imrakul is a monster. Imrakul is a force to be reckoned with. It is something you can't deny the power and sort of... <sighs> Majesty? Is that the word? Is that where we're going with this? The majesty of her noodly wonderfulness? Because Imrakul is amazing. <laughs> Number 18 is Jazam Jin. Now that could be like Jazam Jin, or I've even heard Jazam Jin, which is kind of ridiculous, but Jazam is what we're going with. Now Jazam showed up in Arabian Nights. It was one of the most iconic characters in the game. When I first found Magic, there were a few cards that I came upon, and there was some artwork that I came upon, and I absolutely loved it, and so on and so forth, but it wasn't it wasn't too long before you ran smack dab into Jazam Jin. You read an Inquest, you read a Scythe, like there were, there were all, or a Scry, rather. Um, there were all sorts of, you know, 
there were all sorts of images of magic and they they absolutely made Jazam Jin a poster child of magic. It was on products, it was on like portfolios, it was on big three ring binders. You know, Jazam Jin certainly represented to me a lot of what magic was and that really sick artwork and the great smile and holding the dude, it was really awesome. When it first showed up, the printing of the two was so dark for the two generic mana, a lot of people were playing it for two black mana, which was busted even, you know, even by the day standards, I think a two black five five deal you damage during your upkeep is, is a little too far but regardless people caught on that yes it's a four mana five five that four mana five five stat that deal you one damage it took them a long time it took wizards a long time to give you something like that again one of the other cool things about jazam Jin is its connection to slivers now slivers are some of the most celebrated and awesome cards and creatures in magic and that's fantastic but they didn't really want to reprint jazam Jin, but they could reprint it in like a weird form and so they did with plague sliver plague sliver was from time spiral and people were really excited because they finally got jazam Jin back oh my god i'm here it was not very good it was interesting though that you could bring in Plague Sliver against other Sliver decks and really punish them, which was kind of cool. Uh, but Jazam Shin, in and of itself, as a 5-5, five, 4-mana five, 5-5, five, five, okay, whatever. We've passed those stats as being impressive a long time ago. But as a card that lives as part of the history of Magic, as one of the poster childs, as one of the first images that really resonated with me with how cool Magic is, Jazam is absolutely deserving of its spot. <laughs> Number 17 is Voice of Resurgence. Now look, you can't not want to put the card that makes the token with your artwork on it of your likeness, you know, on your top 100 favorite. It just has to be. It has to be up there. Otherwise, this is clearly the best card in Dragon's Maze. Dragon's Maze was so bad. It was so bad. It was unreal. When Brad and I were reviewing sets, and we would go through sets, and we would talk about them, you know, at the end of the thing, we would finish our last segment, and we'd be kind of, you know, walking out the door and sort of chit-chatting and whatnot. There were a few sets that, after we got finished filming, we were like, hmm... I don't think this set's very good. <laughs> and that happened two times. Uh, one was Born of the Gods, and the second was Dragon's Maze. And Dragon's Maze is just terrible value. The EV is so unbelievably low. It's clear they just took a mythic slot, they made it one of the most ridiculous values for two mana ever, and they cranked it out. So that sucks. But for the, the card itself, that's okay. The card itself is modern playable, cube playable, EDH goodness. All the good things that Magic Card's doing, but it makes a me. So when it makes a me, and I'm not a Mario, but it makes a me, I'm going to want to put it on my top favorite cards. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Voice of Resurgence is too good not to love. It's too good not to love. It deserves to love. The deer, hoof, love thing, all up in that. Two mana, two do is the best thing ever. <laughs> Number 16 is Baneslayer Angel. Oh my god, Baneslayer Angel. When Magic 2010 showed up, now 2010 was supposed to be the big reboot. Magic 2010 was they're going to take the core set and they're going to take 10th edition and they're going to make it something totally different. There's going to be brand new cards in the core set. And people were like, oh man, what's going to happen? And what are they going to put it mythic? Because there's never been really mythic in base sets before. And they were going to, they're going to try all this new stuff. And here comes one of the most busted five mana creatures ever to see print at that time. Certainly at that time, it was just at the tippity top. And it quickly shot up in value. It became the first $50 magic card. People were just losing their minds over this thing. It won a pro tour, for God's sakes, via the hands of Brian Kibler. There is a lot to love about Baneslayer Angel. Greg Staples did an unbelievably good job at the artwork. The artwork is just so beautiful. They've not touched it, and there's a good reason for that. And... You know, when you have some of the best angels ever and you're able to, you know, line up angels and there's Sarah Angel and whatnot, I think Bane Slayer is absolutely near the top because it basically redefined what a good creature is supposed to be in standard. And a lot of people just couldn't believe it. They're like, oh my god, there's all these stats. There's a 5-5 five, five, and it's got flying, it's got the weird protection from demons thing and dragons, but it's really thematic, so that's cool. You know, so Bane Slayer having all these words on it, having all these abilities, being really, really powerful was something that the Magic player base kind of had to get used to. And so nowadays, yeah, there's like some creatures in a set that are just way, way too good, too good, depending on what lens you want to view it in. Baneslayer was the best thing in the format for a while, and for quite a while. She got reprinted once, and they kind of, you know, they kind of let her go, and she was back in From the Vault Angels, which is awesome. Uh, but Baneslayer Angel is just, you know, it's one of those cards that you can't not love, I feel. Like, you know, if you play it, you're going to love it. If you like the art, or if you like the art of magic, you're going to love it. You know, the impact on the game itself, 
it is hard to deny, and it's hard to say that anything is going to be better than Bane Slayer Angel at doing what she does in the entire package. Oh, God, I love Bane Slayer Angel. Number 15 is Elvish Archers. Now, I know we're getting into that weird place where you're like, this isn't one of the greatest creatures or things of all time, so on and so forth. Well, Elvish Archers, when I first played Magic, when I first joined Magic, it was a big deal. Now, again, as I've spoken before, Savannah Lions, Savannah Lions right here. Elvish Archers, however, were just, they had the most badass art. I mean, look at that thing. And it's really difficult to recapture the the sort of the, the, the sweet, sort of the, the power of that pose, like the badassery, and there's the, there's just the, the, the colors of it, and there's plenty to love about Elvish Archers. But at the time, it was a rare. This is a rare card. A green and a generic man for a 2-1 first strike is like a common these days. It was rare back then. It was a big deal. The artwork was absolutely beautiful. When I played white green aggro, you needed four Elvish Archers just like you needed four Savannah Lions. And the artwork, again, when I first joined Magic, it was one of the biggest things that spoke to me. And I fell in love with this card. I really enjoyed playing with it. It's always had just a special place. It's just right here. Number 14 is Time Walk. Well, hello, Time Walk. Hello, Power Nine. How you doing? Now, we're starting to get into some of the upper, upper echelons. We're starting to get into some of the biggest, most powerful effects in the game. Time Walk, clearly one of them. A card that is clearly busted. A card that whenever you can say, or whenever people say there's power creep, you know, oh my God, magic is power creeping it out. This is too good. Whenever you, you see a Bane Slayer type angel, whenever you see a spell that you think is too good, there ain't nothing that's come close to Time Walk. And for pretty much good reason. There was Temporal Mastery, but that took like some manipulation. It didn't do anything as to what people expected it to. It was certainly sexy and interesting, though. But no, there's no Time Walk. And I'm not talking about the new painting Time Walk because they had to redo all the artwork for contracts or reasons or whatever, something legal. But either way, the original Amy Weber Time Walk is one of those iconic and fantastic images. It's one of those things that stick with you. It's one of those effects that, you know, clearly blue should get for two whopping mana. Uh, it's one of those cards that you're kind of gifted to play. When you're able to play this card, Time Walk, whether it's in Cube, whether it's in Casual, whether it's in Vintage, it just it feels like there's something special there because you know not everybody gets this effect, not everybody even gets this card. They're so expensive these days, you know that a Time Walk is valuable. It's rare. It's fantastic. It sucks that they had to put new artwork on it. I understand why, but the original will always be just one of the most lauded cool cards ever. But I think we have another one. Number 13 is Ancestral Recall. Oh, yes. Ancestral freaking recall. Things have been called Ancestral Recall. Things have acted like Ancestral Recall. Things could even think about looking like sometimes Ancestral Recall. There's only one Ancestral Recall. There's only one blue. Draw three cards in the same cycle. Let's remember, it's in the same cycle as Lightning Bolt, Giant Growth, <laughs> and Dark Ritual, and Healing Salve. Healing salve. Ooh, man, draw three cards or prevent three damage and gains in life. Let me tell you, it wasn't really close. Ancestral Recall is just it's a monster powerful card. Again, just like Time Walk, you can't say that they are they're they pushed magic too far. When you don't have Moxon yet, you don't have anything better than Ancestral Recall or Time Walk. We've just not gone anywhere close to the early days, and that's a good thing. This is a card that's a barometer. This is a card that sort of speaks to the history of Magic. I mean, Mark Poole did an amazing job at illustrating it, you know, so it's it's one of those cards, those artworks that you can't really sort of forget, which is really great. And there's a lot of artworks like that in the original set where they're just really cool, impactful, they're stark, they're interesting. And, and so it's to recall is a card that you're never going to, I think get tired of playing you're never going to get tired of seeing it's hard to ever get upset at drawing one at basically any time ever so uh you know it's restricted for a reason you only you can only play one of it in any format that you want to play you can only play one if you're going to go for like the power nine if this is if you're going to go for your first power nine more than likely you're going for the lotus but if you're going for number two you're probably going for recall because few things are as awesome powerful sexy incredible as ancestral recall Number 12 is Tarmogoyf. Tarmogoyf. Woo! Let me tell you, when Future Sight came out, no one liked Tarmogoyf. No one talked about it. No one was excited about it. There weren't a lot of previews article, articles written about it. There wasn't much anything going on about Tarmogoyf. And if you go back and you look at the, at the archive of Brian David Marshall, 
and he wrote, I think, uh, The Week That Was is what it was called back then. I don't know what it's called these days. But he wrote something called The Week That Was. He would have some interviews with people you know, in the community. And he interviewed me at this at one point about Tarmogoyf. And you can go back and read this. It's absolutely hilarious. Where I was like, you know, I got a feeling about that Tarmogoyf card. That card, you know, seems really good. And you don't, you know, if you can just you can cycle some cards and get some cards in your graveyard, maybe it would be super awesome. Like... Little did we know that just plain magic makes Tarmogoyf amazing. But at the time, it was like, well, you know, if you kind of use Edge of Autumn and if you kind of just, you know, reach a little bit, maybe it'll get there. Yeah. So, you know, Tarmogoyf is one of those cards that gives everybody that magical story. And if you've heard anyone who's in it, whether it's MTG Finance or they've been playing magic a long time, a lot of them have that old classic story of, well, I got 100 Tarmogoyfs at four bucks a pop. When any, when nobody else thought they were good, I thought it was great. And I cashed in and I wish I still had them today and blah, 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 blah. It's just, you have your $100 creature. It's a $100 creature. Sometimes more, sometimes a little bit less, but you know, easy hundo. Easy inclusion in all the Modern Master sets because you can't really have too many Tarmogoyfs. So you don't really play like one Tarmogoyf or two Tarmogoyfs. You don't play the whole set if you're gonna play them. Tarmogoyf in and of itself, the design was kind of just, it was oppressive. I mean, let's face it, it was really overpowered. And the fact that it was star and star plus one meant that other Tarmogoyfs would bounce off other Tarmogoyfs, and that was always kind of an issue and kind of a pain in the butt. So, you know, Tarmogoyf in and of itself is an amazing card because of sort of what it does, what it represents. It's the best thing that there basically is in green in terms of a raw creature, like good old fashioned power to toughness to mana cost, whether it's the impact on constructed, whether it's the impact on legacy to this day, impact on modern to this day, I mean, impact on modern master sets to this day. I mean, you have Pascal Maynard making one of the most, you know, amazing, crazy picks of a foil Tarmogoyf over a much better spell for his limited deck, which turned into a whole debacle of Goyfgate all by itself, which was fun. You know, and that just doesn't happen with any other creature. It doesn't happen with any other card in Modern Masters, but this one. So, you know, you have the history, you have the power, you have the importance, you have Tarmogoyf as one of the best and one of my favorite cards of all time. Number 11 is Umazawa Jite. Oh boy, we've gotten to Brokenville, Population Us, because this card is completely busted. Now, the story of Umazawa Jite is that instead of minus one, minus one, it would, it would add two mana to your mana pool. Now, the issue being, as I recall, that even if it's modal, if one of the abilities is a mana ability, mana abilities can't be countered. So you could not counter Umazawa Jite if it had that type of ability. So they changed it to minus one, minus one to kind of offset the plus two, plus two. And here we are. And it's broken. <laughs> they accidentally, the whole format, because everything became Umazawa Jite advantage. And Umazawa Jite also lived in a world where if you both played a legend, then they both died. So you played for the Umazawa Jite no matter what. If you could really abuse it, it didn't matter because it would stop them from being able to use their Umazawa Jite. Oh God, it was, there was these, through the Jite Wars, like we got to Paladin Onvek. Paladin Onvek, two white and generic mana for a 2-2, two -two, first strike, pro red, pro black. Now at the time there was Wildfire decks and Magnivore decks. And so Magnivore and Wildfire, they were just blowing up the world. They were stealing stuff. They were annexing, they were stone raining, whatever. Paladin Onvek was not only immune to Wildfire, it was immune to being blocked by Magnivore and it could carry a Jite better than almost any other creature thanks to first strike. So combat, plus Umazawa Jite equals madness, and you're never really probably going to win in a lot of those scenarios. Now, let's go back a little bit, and let's go back to the Betrayer's pre-release, because I was there. Remember, I started back in Magic around Dark Steel, and man, I was all about it. Magic was fun. Champions Kamigawa pre-release was awesome. Betrayer's was fun. I was in some random hotel ballroom. Everybody was playing. It was like round one, maybe round two of the, of the, the, the big pre-releases. Back then, they would run like you know eight or nine round Swiss pre-releases and then you would cut to a top eight and they'd be giving away boxes and boxes. Nowadays you run smaller flights and that's fine. But back then everybody got to play and so the best decks were basically making their way to the top tables. Well just by round two you could tell that like there were four spots at the top two tables you know and all of them had was always Jete in their deck like every single one. It was little ridiculous and so there was to be like oh, so shit, oh, so shit. I mean like I remember hearing the murmur for God's sakes of like oh, so shit, oh my god and then and then wizards put it in a precon oh my god wizards put it in a precon 
Woo! So Rat's Nest was a pre-con that they made with an Umazawa Jete inside, and turns out those were the only ones that were selling. But when you would buy pre-cons, like as a retailer, well, you had to get like the whole set. And nobody wanted the whole set. Everybody just wanted Rat's Nest. So they would just buy the Rat's Nest and that was it. So there was a whole problem with that. There was the problem that they changed an ability at the end of the at the end of development from a mana ability to a minus one minus one. So it had total complete combat control. The fact that it was not legendary did not balance it out at all. It was crazy good. It was crazy overpowering. It was one of those cards that, you know, you could you could do a lot of like the Babe Ruth called shot. And it happened one time for me. I swear, I swear I was in a draft with two champions and one betrayer's pack. And I said, boys, when it was always just damn there. And I opened it and I'll be damned. There it was. Uma's always just there in my deck. I drew it. I equipped it. I died. Yeah, I lost. I lost in round one. Because, you know, if you're going to get the nuts, you got you to gotta pay that karma debt somewhere. And I got the Uma's always just there, but I lost the draft. It made me sad. No one could believe it. You know, it was like, oh, my God, you really got your damn. Like, yeah, dude, this is what happened. Had all the sword of Tommy. Had a bunch of flyers. It didn't matter. Got crushed. Who cares? Uma's always Jete, one of the best magic cards of all freaking time. Man, I absolutely love it. And that is our 20 through number 11 countdown. We got 10 to go. The big one. We're ready to do this. You ready to do this? You're going to see some cards you were absolutely not prepared for. Maybe some cards you expect to see. I think it's going to be a good time. I want to thank you guys very much for hanging out with me, talking about my favorite cards. If you like this, you subscribe it, and you like it, and you tell me what you think in the comments, because all that stuff lets people know I exist, and I really appreciate it. So until next time, Magic players, this is Evan Irwin, tapping the cards so you don't have to.